Today's topic is delivered by Shantanu Mandal, who is a co-founder and CTO at uh, Kulam AI. And before joining uh, or before co-founding Kulam AI, he worked for a number of years in uh, General Motors. He joined General Motors first as a senior engineer and later as a lead product engineer. In particular, his specialization has been in electric vehicle systems development. And in this, uh, he has worked on electric powertrain, battery, electric vehicle charging systems, and so on. Apart from this domain knowledge in automotive, uh, he also has a passion for applied mathematics, algorithms, and programming. So this led him to towards machine learning uh, as a parallel skill or an expertise, you can say. So, uh, so because of his expertise in uh, automotive as well as in machine learning, uh, he is now the CTO of Coolum AI. So in Coolum AI, you can look it up, it's coolum.ai. In Coolum AI, they do real-time uh, battery analytics. So by doing this, they hope to improve the lifespan of a battery as, as well as the efficiency of a battery and probably bring down the maintenance costs of batteries as well. He have, uh, in terms of his education, he is a graduate of IIT Kharagpur, where he got his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And then from IIT Bombay, he got a master's degree in mechanical engineering. So with that short introduction, I would now like to hand over to Shantanu. Shantanu? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Arvin, for such a nice introduction. And thanks, Arvind, for giving up, giving me opportunity to present over in the DevoVidia platform. So, like, I had Arvind is running DevoVidia for quite a long time, and I remember like three years back when I attended the first session of DevoVidia, I wanted to be a speaker also, and I think today <clears throat> that is becoming a full circle. So, with that, I'll share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Yeah, hello everyone. So I'm Shantanu, and as uh, Arvind has already introduced me, so I'm the co-founder and CTO of Columbia, and I'll just tell you two lines about Coulomb AI. So what we do is uh, basically we are a battery analytics software company. Uh, and what we do is that we collaborate with OEM and uh, EV fleet operators. So we work on EV batteries, so it is always easy. So EV OEMs and uh, EV fleet operators and help reduce the battery failures on, on field as well as uh, increase the battery life of increase the battery life so that it can be run for longer time it not only increases the revenue for our customers but also reduces the uh, electronic wastage load on the ecosystem so this is brief about the coulomb AI. and before i jump into the uh, presentation uh, i just wanted to understand that the audiences like what are the background audiences are coming from? If you can please unmute and uh, tell one by one. Yeah, I'm from uh, software development, IT slash telecom. Mm -hmm. Not much knowledge in battery systems, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm familiar with IoT and analytics of IoT. Yeah. Okay. And why is MLOps so interesting to you? Sorry. Uh, see, I am the organizer, so I have to be in the call whether it's interesting or not. Okay, but in no, general, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, in Devopedia, I mean, we are using machine learning. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, uh, the machine learning model that we have developed so far is not yet in production. But later on, uh, ML, ML ops will become important once it goes into production. Yeah. So now it is more like uh, gaining that knowledge. Later on, we will start applying. Yeah, I mean, uh, what about other audiences? I know most of them, so I'll briefly uh, give a quick introduction. Ramanathan, who is also a trustee, 
he mm -hmm. is a data scientist by profession so okay. from whatever you will be saying that is very much relevant to him he mm -hmm. in his job uh, 9 to 5 he is looking at data and uh, looking at the machine learning models okay so that way it is very much relevant to him uh, arjun uh, who is on the call he is uh, a student of machine learning you can say mm -hmm. he is actually a technical journalist but uh, looking at the manufacturing sector but uh, more and more uh, now he is doing a iit course uh, uh, specialization in data science so okay. he is uh, training himself to become a data scientist okay and then uh, one more person rajan nagendra he runs his own startup where he cons uh, gives consultancy to many companies on improving their code quality mm -hmm. so machine learning could be part of it but again for me gaining knowledge he must be attending this session mm -hmm. then we have ralph uh, who is also from technical background just mm -hmm. for uh, he doesn't have in depth uh, knowledge in machine learning but uh, he knows the basics Okay, Eril Arasan. I don't know this person. Yeah, Eril, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, I am Eril Arasan. I am from Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. So still, I am working in Bangalore and uh, Nissan company. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I know and a little bit little on HTML uh, HTML CSS uh, JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So still, I am started with the uh, uh, MLA data science team. Okay. So I uh, I learned something. I I joined. Okay. 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 Uh, this is uh, referring for uh, Sabir, uh, my friend. Sure, sure. Thanks for joining the call. Anthony, you can uh, take over. Okay, I'll continue. Yeah. So, first, we'll define what MLOps is. So, there are multiple definitions available given by multiple organizations. So, Google, who is the pioneer for the whole ML, AI ML uh, thing, so they define ML as a set of processes and capabilities which helps building, deploying, and operationalizing ML systems rapidly and fast and reliably consistently. And there is one famous community, Open Data Science Community. So they also define ML uh, as a mode of communication between the data scientist and operation team or the production. Slides are not changing. Uh, okay, it's not changing. Okay, I think it has an animation, so I don't think animation will work. So I'll just uh, stop sharing once. And you can start the slideshow. It, I think it was in. Yeah, I have started. Uh, no, I started the slide so slow the slideshow. But right, right. We are not seeing it that way. Can you see it now? We can see the second slide, but uh, yeah, we can also see on the left side all the slides as if you are in a edit mode. Okay, I am presenting in a full screen actually. Okay, okay. Then probably what you're sharing is different from what you're. Okay, let me share the full screen instead of only the app. Yeah, please. Uh, Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah, I think. What is, is ML ops? Yes, I can see the animation also. Okay. Yeah, so this is the Google definition. Then there is a famous community, open database community. See, so they also defined as a mode of communication between the data scientist and the production team. And it is uh, deeply collaborative in nature, like multiple teams come across and they communicate and pass the information and build the system around that. And its main purpose is to eliminate waste as well as uh, time, time wastage as well as resource wastage and some later learning instead of 
implementing ML ops first. So, and this is the NVIDIA actually puts it very simply that ML ops actually set up best practices and it purpose is to make the AI business successful. Whatever it takes to make it successful. So like uh, joining all those info, uh, this thing, uh, definition, uh, this is what I understand that is basically a collaborative approach between mainly three verticals. One is data science ML team, and is data engineering team, and is DevOps team or the production team. And their main purpose is to uh, make the business successful. So whatever will make the business uh, goal is what will whatever will help the business goal met uh, is uh, MLOPS. And yeah, it is basically uh, functions around set of defined standard practices. Now, this is the most important thing to understand that why MLOPS is essential for success, mainly for AI companies or the companies who are uh, delivering AI solutions to the uh, customers. Why, I mean, basically failure is almost obvious without MLOPS for the AI company. So to understand that, we'll start with a bit of uh, project management and I'll get into the uh, like recipe uh, gradually. So for any project actually starts from a business goal or KPI. And like for example, for ours, let's say reduce battery failures by 30%. Then that's get transferred into engineering KPI. Engineering KPI can be time bound like, you know, and the success rate bound. So like we'll have to, let's say in order to reduce the battery failure, we'll have to make some engineering KPI uh, which will be let's say some battery related parameter uh, or it can be multiple parameters basically like voltage current and things stops like that so uh, those things will monitor and uh, i mean the combination of those things will ultimately give uh, rise to basically result in 30 percent of less battery failure as well as it, it can be time bound that only reducing the battery failure is uh, not good enough but we'll have to do it in a good enough time like let's say i can uh, ensure my engineering team can ensure that the result that we are serving to the customer has to be like two hours before the failure so that customer can take action on that so in order for a business to business solution to be successful we can have multiple engineering kpis and then we will do the mod ml project scoping so we understood that this this will be ml project this uh, falls into the domain of ml it can be solved with the standard deterministic approaches so for that uh, ml team comes and they scope the project means they see whether data are leveled or not what is the data quality whether we have the resource availability for doing that kind of ml in production or not so once those are uh, clear to ML group that how it can be uh, implemented and uh, served to the production. After that, we define the ML project target metrics so like F1 rate or TPR or MAP. So, so these are the final ML project or data science project metrics. Now with that in mind, let's say uh, you are a data science engineer and you are working on this problem and so you take initial four weeks for exploration and two weeks for modeling and then after multiple experimentation uh, your model meets the target metrics in turn and test then it, it is deployed and but it doesn't pass the validation or the project metrics. Uh, then you actually frantically check that what is going wrong, why it, why it is not passing the validation. 
then you take more data and do some data mining and after that you understood that okay ground truth has been changed over the time by the time model is trained and tested so you took six weeks or let's say eight weeks for complete deployment and in that eight weeks the data distribution has changed and ml model is not giving uh, not meeting the correct uh, root mean square error or whatever matrix you said uh, another scenario let's say you deploy it in production and it successfully passes the validation but from the it runs very good uh, for the first month everyone is happy but from second month onwards your company is getting too many customer tickets customer is complaining about your ai solution that it is not giving the uh, correct information it has too many false positive or too many false negative so or maybe some other kind of issue and uh, you check uh, what is happening and you understood that model runtime has become uh, too high so since it's a time bounded problem that kind of runtime is not acceptable so that that can be another problem and let's say another scenario alternate scenario where you've deployed in production and from the second month it is not meeting the uh, criteria and customers are complaining you start your investigation and in the process your uh, you create 20 notebooks and because data sensor scientists are very fond of notebooks so you create 20 notebooks and or maybe a very very long notebook in, with a lot of experience and uh, you do override some of the cells which are at the top and which are dependent on the bottom one and so all kind of mess happens over there and after that so you let's say you do a night night out and next day come to the office and deploy the model in production you're exhausted and in in that way you just deployed the model with wrong data processing I means uh, like you obviously do some feature engineering stuff and after that you deploy the model so enable code and model are two separate things so you deploy the model with different code and your model is not working and you are frustrated so that can be another issue or fourth one is um, that there is a new person in the data science team and you move into different uh, uh, verticals in the organization or different team and he takes over your old project and this is a continuous improvement activity uh, so his first task will be to understand whatever you have done that is a kt kt part knowledge transfer uh, he understand all those things and but your all those feature engineering hyper training and model training matrix are stored in a tabular format or in a database or in a spreadsheet so it takes a huge time for him to understand what is happening because there is no automation or anything any email drops involved so he just manually looks it looks at it and understand it and after that uh, let's say once those kt is over he actually uh, starts with your old code he wants to run your old code and when he runs that he sees that the result that you have uh, mentioned uh, during your project does not match with his result which is running with so he can reproduce the training result with same accuracy so these are all sorts of problems there can be so many other problems so the point with those is that uh, so in any email project there can be many more point of failure as compared to the conventional software development project which is more deterministic in nature and also we have been doing it for many decades so the uh, process is kind of established but but ml is a evolving field and it has multiple things mainly data ml model and code 
all those three things has to be taken into account apart from obviously the production hygiene and production practices so all those things has to be taken into account so it is much more larger than devops and that requires for a new calls for a new skill sets and so and mlops basically ultimately uh, makes the life simple for the data science professional as well as the leadership team and makes the communication much more smoother Uh, so all these sets will look into the inside the mlops like what actually it looks like uh, so arvin i can take question actually since we don't have any limitation on the time so i can take questions so please let me know if you have any questions in between yeah we can take a pause here anyone has questions at this point Okay, not a question from my side just a comment mm -hmm. uh, yeah it a uh, good explanation of uh, our introduction to ml ops and what kind of problems it solves mm -hmm. so i found that it was a good introduction to start with okay thanks so i'll continue with the ml ops uh, framework i mean we'll zoom into what ml ops look like under the hood so this is one uh, good very good picture i mean we can find tons of picture over the internet but this is one picture which kind of simplifies also is detailed enough as well as simple enough to understand the ml ops so it mainly has four layers so first thing is the data management layer uh, second part is the model building layer so when you are building the model starting from feature extraction uh, and feature prioritization and basically all the way to model building training and testing then third part is the model deployment layer so which where devops practices comes in and we uh, the email is deployed just like a regular software but yeah model versioning was important one important thing which comes into picture i'll come to that and fourth layer is the monitoring layer so since there are so many uh, aspects or layers involved over here it is very much important to have a monitoring layer and not only these layers uh, but monitoring has to be done on the other things as well so i'll talk about that so yeah so you can divide it into four layers broadly the first layer is the data management layer for mlops so this is not exactly data engineering data engineering i define as basically how the data flows ac across the organization and mlops can be only one of the consumer for the data but data engineering actually involves all the data streaming and data uh, stream processing and like lambda architecture and all those things basically uh, and ml can be can be only one of the consumers and ml is mostly the consumer for the olap part that is the analytics part of the or uh, not olap but oltp also it can do but it mostly works on the batch processing of the data and not on the stream processing of the data so data engineering is much more vast and this layer is only for the ml ops Email project. So, first, what is the data processing? Sorry, I'll take some water. Yeah. So, first, what is the data processing? Processing means. Uh, so, even we were starting the email, we'll just have a look at the data and clean up the data if required and understand the structure of the data and things like that. that and later on that will be replaced with an etl mm -hmm. then data validation also will be done so where we'll check the quality of data in terms of multiple metrics like 
accuracy of the data, completeness of the data, and consistency of whether it is coming in, let's say what time series data, what is the, whether it is supposed to come in every five seconds, whether that is happening or there are huge time gaps inside. Uh, and also, yeah, that is the time time limits actually. Consistency is more about whether it's, I mean, from time series point of view, uh, whether it's out of order or not. Like sometimes we do see that data is coming from one day before. Uh, for some reason, it is stored in IIT and started pinging today. The yesterday. So all those are data quality issues, and it needs to be validated before and otherwise, if we start building ML model blindly, so this will cause an issue in the latest phase of the project. Uh, so after all those things are done, before starting the ML project, we'll do a data versioning. So just like we do code versioning in Git, in ML model, data is also one of the major pillar. And so that's why data has to be versioned. So why? Because uh, you have heard about CI, CD and DevOps. But in ML, actually, there is uh, additional part, which is called continuous training, CT. So the model has to be uh, retrained again and again. Uh, you should be trained once and deployed uh, forever. It has to be returned again and again just to make sure the email model is relevant to the uh, today's data or the current current data. Hey Shantanu, a quick thing. Yeah. I see something reproduce the training results. Have mm -hmm. you been successful or uh, or how to be successful reproducing the training results? I so, tried but was not very successful. Yeah, so reproducing training results require all the things you require uh, basically all the artifacts you used during your model training right so what is required during model training one is correct data because your ml model is as good as your data so correct data you'll have to have that what exact data you used during that training part and second part is the code so code is uh, whatever let's say feature engineering or uh, feature extraction you have used and um, basically there can be other models in the code which can do some parameter tuning and stuffs like that so all those stuffs has to be present only then you can reproduce the results so one more thing that the initialization of the weights are not an r control right uh, initialization is not in our control, right? Then reproducibility is a question. Yeah, so if you are thinking about deep learning point of view, you are saying that uh, whether it will be stuck in a local, local minimum or maximum that you can con cannot control. That's what you are saying. I'm saying when we when we initialize the weights to the parameters. Or weights to the model itself, mm -hmm. we cannot exactly reproduce the results. And I tried initializing the whole network with one. Every time I start, mm -hmm. I still got a different result. That's why I was curious. Sorry to uh, distract. Please carry on. No, no, this uh, that is a valid question. So obviously, um, I don't have much experience on the exactly data science part. Uh, but yeah, I haven't done hands-on on the like especially neural network part, but this you can think about point, point of view of uh, basic ML, like if you are doing a random forest or XGO or stuff like that. So for the deep learning, maybe something additional will be required that needs to be uh, customized and separately taken care of. Okay. But okay, your goal is to basically reproduce the result which you're getting from uh, training and data versioning is an essential part of that. Obviously, as you said that for different kind of email modeling approach, there can be other versioning which is required, other kind of strategy which needs to be taken to add a strategy basically to produce the, reproduce the same training results. 
Okay, okay. So the exception is deep learning. That's a call out. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm not an expert on deep learning. So I mean, maybe okay, there okay. is already some answer which people have thought about. But yeah, I haven't seen that actually. Uh, please carry no, on. We haven't come across that issue. So yeah. yeah thanks. And then there is data pipeline. So whatever, let's say, triple-sing you do and data will listen check and this versioning can be pipeline. So pipeline is another That's term. Right. Of so um, the next question is, um, yeah. just a second. Some strange crosstalk, first time I'm experiencing. Oh, someone else from some other team is talking for the year? Yeah, yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so last part is the data pipeline. So all the layers, we have discussed about three layers. That is, that has to be automated through some orchestrator like Airflow. Uh, this is one of the advanced stages of the envelope, so you can think. And this is then we have the monitor of the data. So this is part of the monitoring layer, but I'm mentioning over here because basically I consider this as a part of the data layer. So the whatever data has been ingested um, for the email model mo monitoring. So before even data processing, so that has to be monitored for two reasons. One is data quality and second thing is the pattern change. So that is something called data drift, if you've heard about. The data drift basically uh, changes in the distribution of the data over time, input data over time. So as you know that if the input distribution changes over time, then email model will, uh, will produce a lot of negatives, uh, false positive or false negatives because ML models will run, will only learn from the ratio of, let's say you have a classification problem, one and zero. If the ratio of one, of one and zero in your training data set is 60 to 40, then ML model is most likely to classify 60% of the this thing. Validation also into 60 to 40, but instead over time, if it becomes let's say 10 or 90, then ML model will produce a lot of false, false negative and false positive. So that's why we need to uh, monitor continuously that what, what was the distribution initially and what is the, what is the current distribution. Then we also need to, once we do pipeline, we need to do resource monitoring because if we deploy something additional orchestrator or anything, uh, you need to monitor the resources also like RAM utilization or uh, CPU utilization or um, basically threads and all those things. And then second layer is the model development layer. So this is mostly known to the uh, data science people. So first part is obviously exploratory data analysis. So you uh basically explore data to understand the data profiles and you understand that what features can be extracted from here and which features are the primary features and which are which can be neglected and once you are done with that uh, you should store those features in a repository or catalog and then experiment tracking will start. So what happens uh, during the model building part, you do a lot of experiment, whether be it the uh, like hyperparameter tuning or multiple uh, kind of modeling approaches or multiple algorithms. So you do a lot of experiments and that is the majority of the time where data scientist time uh, for data science projects. So all those results of the experiment, there should be some system which will 
automatically capture and store the outcome of those inputs and outputs of those experimentation so that you can refer to it later and uh, take decision that which experiment is most successful and which you should be using for your further testing. So this is called experiment tracking and email flow actually is open source and out of, uh, tool, very good tool, which we also use and it gives out of the box experiment tracking. And then code version management. So this is the traditional uh, code versioning. So we use Git for that. So here, as I said that you basically store all those codes which is written in the notebooks in the in some version management system and you have to integrate your uh, regular data science work with the this git version management so that you can continuously pull it and automate the things so code is different from model from the ml point of view model is basically some kind of abstract quantity which stores some kind of input output relation and code is basically all the scripting part around the model and yeah then you can track the training resources like we use spark for uh, this email works basically so we track the like spark version which is being being used and also the resources let's say easy to machines what configuration is being used and all those settings so that you can reproduce the result later and then pipelining pipeline is as i said which is basically another term for automating all the training part which you've done because you need to do continuous training in future so it needs to be automated and this is a uh, like ML ops has multiple levels. ML ops level 0, 1, 2, 2 is 2 being the highest. So this is one of the requirements for ML ops level 2 or highest level of ML ops. And then there is model de deployment layer. So this is mostly related to the uh, operations team or production team. So for this uh, data scientist has to do another step which is called model versioning. So as you said, code and model are two separate things. So there has to be a model registry. So which will tell you that. Uh, so you must have uh, basically created multiple models during your uh, training, training and testing. And you also need to continuously deploy it in the production or development or staging. So there has to be a model registry which will tell that okay my uh, version a of the model is deployed in development uh, version 3 of the model is deployed in development version 2 is in staging version 1 is production and those version details will also be there the what is there in version a and what has changed from version a to version 3 so all this will be contained in a model registry and so Git is not a very good um, this thing. Uh, I was a candidate for this kind of versioning. And this model registry also comes out of the box from email flow. But there are a lot of uh, tools actually available which are doing experiment tracking and model registry. So I have included some of the links at the end. So you can find multiple like Neptune AI which picture I've shown at the beginning. They're also very famous in when MLOPs come into picture. So they also have very good functionality. Neptune AI, H2O, and all those are famous ones. H2O is the open source one. MLPro is also an open source one. And second part is model packaging. So as you know that all production systems should be contrarized. Uh, this is the standard DevOps practice so that once the scalability comes, it basically creates the hygiene for your deployment. Like you can deploy in multiple environments. And also when the scaling requires, you can just scale up the containers. 
and then model serving. So ultimately the running the model is not sufficient. Um, result has to come out of the model through some API. So and many um, platforms are there which gives out of the box REST API for the models. So this REST API thing can be, uh, I mean, you can simply deploy the model through a flask, uh, this thing, uh, first framework and which can expose some API or there are some ready-made tools which like SageMaker or Azure ML. So they actually provide a REST API, although they are not containerized, but they expose an REST API which can serve the ML result to the outside of the ML world. So, and then for the deployment, so there can be many deployment strategy which your DevOps team will know about. It can be A to B, it can be blue green, it can be canary or any other strategy basically. And you can decide to deploy on multiple hardware, many hardware so like edge devices, IT devices, you can deploy on CPU, GPU. Most of the time it is not in your hand, but in your organization or customers, it's basically how to deploy. So there are some platforms, uh, I think Azure has some IoT solutions, so you can directly deploy the email model on the edge devices. Yeah. Third, fourth part is the monitoring layer. So here you model everything basically which can go wrong in an MLOP system to make sure that yeah, you are well aware of, aware of uh, the issues which might be going on in the whole MLOPs, uh, this architecture scenario and have a control over it. So one thing is model performance monitoring. So as I've shown in that example that a model runtime performance has to be monitored most because that can, mostly that goes bad over time. And also AV testing performance. So if you have deployed multiple models into multiple customers and doing a AV testing, so like monitoring the performance of those. And monitoring data trip. So I've already talked about data trip. Data trip is the changing changes in the model's input distribution, uh, which makes the ML model go bad over time. So you need to monitor that and as and when required, so treat it in the model or take it to your customers and inform them about it. And also detect data integrity issues like uh, a lot of time it happens that data was having four columns then after some time one column in missing column is missing in that stream or maybe one extra column is there uh, basically data structure changes over time so that needs to be also taken uh, monitored and needs to be taken to the customer and discuss about it in Otherwise, what will happen? Your model will fail and the blame will be upon you. That why it is not working. And then you're yeah, monitoring all the pipelines, which I've talked about in the previous layers. So yeah. So I'll now move into example of envelopes in production, but before that, any questions, I'll take it. Okay, uh, I have sure. a question on versioning of data. Mm -hmm. So I am assuming that Git is not the Git or GitHub is not the right place where people keep their data. Yeah, yeah. So where do they keep it typically? So DVC is a very famous tool for this data version control. So it it's uh, I mean they that is a paid software obviously DVC, but that gives a lot of flexibility out of the box but otherwise you can store the data i mean what we do we don't use dvc but we stored it in the s3 in the parquet format so okay and we level label the data properly so that whenever uh, it is required it can be retrieved from there but you can use database also 
can just store it in a table. Or, but database obviously is not meant for storage of the data, but delivery of the data mainly. Now another question is, uh, I have a model which is an NLP model. Mm -hmm. Probably it is not optimized. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when I do inference on CPU, it takes uh, order of minutes, maybe one mm -hmm. minute, two minutes. Okay. But same model, if I run on GPU for inference, it will mm -hmm. take uh, less than a second. Mm -hmm. So now obviously in production, I want to run it on a GPU for inference. Yeah. But problem is uh, when a request comes through REST API, at that time I cannot spin a VM with a GPU because it will take some time. So I have to keep my VM with GPU running 24 seven, which becomes very expensive. So uh, the question is, how do people solve this problem in practically in the real world? So for that, you can uh, put on even when uh, this thing in between that whenever that uh, event happens the rest API calls only th then it will be running and after that it, it will be stopped but nobody uh, as far as i could make out nobody in the cloud is giving such a service because uh, uh, i don't know i think the big vendors cloud providers if mm -hmm. you take any similar function as a service or lambda mm -hmm. it only spins a cpu not a gpu yeah you can use the airflow is the open source one Apache Airflow. Oh. So you can use that orchestrator also. That will have some API which will connect with your, uh, let's say, ML side, which will oh. also, maybe you can have some infrastructure as a code if you want, and which okay. will speed up GPU and also run the ML model. And on the other side, it will connect with your REST API and it will take the request from there. Okay, okay. Thanks for Simple. that. I'll look into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the monitoring layer, and then yeah, I'll go into an example because I think this will make the understanding simpler. So let's say a bank approaches your company and they have a an issue with the fraudulent transaction, which are making them lose millions. Uh, every quarter and that is happening through their credit card uh, so ultimately your business actually hands uh, makes you responsible for uh, basically this project so you are the head of the project and you have to tackle the issue so first part is uh, basically the planning so you need to define some KPIs or metrics based on which the success of the project will be refined. Let's say you detect 50% fraud transaction within five minutes of it happening. And then you check the scoping and that, yeah, past data which are leveled are also available from the bank. So you can start your ML project. And so first part will be EDA part and data preparation part because you need to ensure the data quality and clean it up if required and then do the feature extraction and also understand the importance of the features and define the shape of the feature which might be used as input vector and so all those data science stuff actually we do over here uh, before training and also uh, you understand the data good enough so that you can prepare one script which will auto level the data. You don't have to rely on bank again and again to detect a fraudulent transaction. I mean, this is an advanced thing. Maybe we can skip it from the beginning part. And then after you have done the feature uh, extraction, you store it into a feature registry. And then you start your model training and testing. So maybe you use some tree based model to train the model, tree based algorithm. And also before that, you also 
uh, you do some hyperparameter training to see whether model can be can predict even better and all these things should be uh, tracked while you are doing the training and hyperparameter optimization uh, basically all these should be tracked through an experiment tracking feature let's say it comes out of the box from ml flow and you have deployed ml flow in a cpu and uh, doing that then yeah you create a pipeline for all your training so you basically pipeline in the sense in ml flow actually we just put all the stages just like you do in a CICD ML file you will write. Similarly, you can write that kind of uh, file and just mention that these are the, these are the stages will be happening one after another, and that makes a pipeline. And if you run that pipeline, so all the stages of your training will run. Uh, and that is very much required because, as I said, you need to do a continuous training later on you can just rely on to this model and then and model deployment part starts so you dockerize the model and hand it over to the devops team and also uh, now it's time to do some pipelining on the actual data ingestion and ingestion part basically so you you have done the training and testing offline now that is going to deployment or production you need to make sure that data ingestion part and transformation the ETL part also happens automatically so you'll have to write some script for that and then for serving model so after it is dockerized and running so before that, you'll have to make sure that it is deployed with the correct framework, which can expose some REST API. And also, this was for single model. So as you as you'll be keep on building multiple models, so you need to have a model versioning systems, uh, and which you might to deploy in development and then move it to production, just like in production. I'm, just like the DevOps guide guys do. So for that purpose, you'll have to have a model versioning system. Then you can create an orchestration, just like I said, you can use some Airflow kind of uh, yeah, basically framework and uh, or some other kind of even different architecture. So whenever some transaction happens, your model runs in front and classifies the transaction, whether it's fraudulent or not. And so after orchestration, you have to monitor all the pipelines and you also check the model runtime and performance, how the model is performing in a production. That you have to continuously monitor and take action if something goes wrong. So monitoring actually gives you a multiple eyes for seeing that where it is going wrong instead of you actually mining the data later on when something fails and trying to figure it out you just prepare a system beforehand that if something goes wrong i'll just take these these monitors and from there i'll understand that what is going wrong and also you create monitors for data integrated drift and server load so these are obvious yeah so I think with this, uh, pretty much I think if you do all those steps, you have you'll have a production grade ML ops. Obviously, you can do many more automation just to make uh, life simple and simple. But you'll have to keep in mind that the more automation you do, you'll have more systems to manage, and all those systems has to be monitored because. It, um, in software development, anything can go wrong. Although people say there is high reliability and all, but yeah, still nobody can say my system is 100% reliable. So 
will obviously have to manage the systems and monitor it continuously. But yeah, these are the essential steps for the for a production grade ML ops. Yeah, for your, I mean, I've incurred some of the very good rate from this article, which will give you a further understanding about the ML ops, how it is deployed in production. And last one, evidently dot evidently I, they were actually a master in the data drip detection. So they are also our best paid in YC. So they are a Russian company. <coughs> Sorry. So this is a open source. Uh, in these, you can, if you go to their website, you can see the open source code. So basically you'll have to reply that in your server and these, these actually is a special tool for data drip detection. They basically see the statistical distribution of the data and from that they uh, show on a high level to the user that data drip is happening and this much of data drip is happening. So yeah, uh, I think that's all from my presentation. Uh, we can, I can take any more question that is there. Uh, does DVC use internally Git? No, no. They themselves are hosted on Git. Uh, yeah, their code base might be hosted, but data versioning basically Git. I mean, they will, they might have some metadata which can be hosted on Git, but not the data itself. And uh, what is the reason for not hosting uh, Git, uh, data on Git? What kind of uh, challenges we see? Yes, yeah, so Git is uh, mainly for uh, like code comparison. You can compare A to B code, like the current, let's say, code in the main branch and the current code in the dev branch. You can compare and or let's say if some commit is coming, so you can compare those two very well. But uh, when it comes to data or model, so it is not suited for that kind of uh, comparison because Git compares line by line. And when you're doing the model building or data, so that has multiple dimensions. So it cannot be captured through a line by line comparison. Great. And uh, can we expect GitHub like, you know, data hub like, uh, you know, SaaS kind of solution, which is open source? or it is already there? Uh, no, uh, can I come again? So you are asking whether DVC kind of open source is there, open source solution is there? No, GitHub is there for open source for anybody mm -hmm. to check in and commit their projects. Mm -hmm. Right. Which are coded. Like that, you know, like GitHub, do you see, a, is there any solution for machine learning which is equivalent to GitHub? Maybe it runs internally DVC. No, actually, I think the data the volume is huge enough. So Git, obviously, Git kind of system they are open source because um, I mean they might not require to store huge amount of data or file sizes. So no, sorry, data, I sorry. I think, let me repeat my question. Mm -hmm. So see, GitHub is built over Git. Yeah, yeah, right. And the value of Git is, you know, anybody who wants to create a project, right, uh, which is a software coded, anybody can actually sign up for free and then start managing their product project. Yes. Right. Similarly, in the data ML ops or uh, in the in the uh, data science area, mm -hmm. because you know GitHub is not able to handle it. Do you have something similar to GitHub? So that anybody can sign up like a SaaS through the browser, they are able to store their model, they are able to do whatever is required for version control. You have something like GitHub in this space. So which supports I have a question from sorry, my from my understanding. Uh, uh, DVC we have to install it to, to use it. So is there what he's probably asking is somebody is posting that as a service. Mm -hmm. DVC. Yes, you're right. Yeah.
uh yeah actually personally i don't i i haven't used that data versioning or dvc but uh, is dvc open source i mean i haven't checked that arvin if you have checked it right now is dvc open source uh, yes it says that open source version control system for machine learning projects okay so yeah so for all the open source one you'll have to deploy it somewhere so deployment will require some some hosted solutions right so you can take any kind of basically ec2 or kind of machine in the cloud and you have to deploy it over there or maybe any container you'll have to deploy or you can take a local laptop and you can deploy docker over here and run dvc okay i think i see one cml something cml dot dev continuous machine learning yeah actually the point is that in machine learning space uh, every day there is some uh, new new framework is coming so and if you go to the neptune ai blog which i have linked in the over here so you can see and you can explore that and understand that there are so many softwares available and that is not even mentioned in the blog so like huge number of software which which will have multiple capability comes pops up every day and they will have some amount of open source part and some part will be controlled by them which they charged so uh, i mean okay sure thank you so much i think it is very helpful at least hearing about dvc i never even heard of it thank you okay i did find uh, by googling something called dags hub so you can take a look at that bad sub dags d a g s hub dot com okay it is uh, yeah hosted and then under the hood it uses tvc looks like okay yeah so i mean it is up to you i mean if you don't want to manage any more system uh, or server you can simply it is just a storage system and you can simply store your data somewhere in the repository or s3 and basically properly level it and that will do the trick but yeah i think dbc gives some of the features out of the box and that that are very, and those might be very handy but i have an explored much on this actually so in your project you mentioned that you are simply storing it on s3 is it right yeah yeah right and then labeling it properly something yeah like yeah that. any other questions from others ramanathan navin Yeah, it's good. Uh, that was uh, useful. Nice talk, Santanu. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I particularly like the example at the end, uh, which you answered with the detailed set of uh, steps. Mm -hmm. So for beginners, that can serve as a blueprint or even a checklist when they get started in ML ops. yeah so my intention was also to keep it as simple as possible and basically take most out of it instead of just putting the theoretical 